Welcome, Rabbi Joseph Ettery. Um, Thank you. Oh. Where, do, where do we start today? Where do we start today? In the parashot, you have a new, uh, you have a new um, slide in the background, Kingdom of Israel. Um, we talked a bit about, of course, about our Sanhedrin initiative before, but perhaps you start with the with your background picture today. Okay, so the kingdom here, you have the uh, the king, you have the high priest, and then you have the Sanhedrin. Under them, you have the Kohanim, the Levim. Then uh, on the side of the Sanhedrin, you have the advisory board. Under them, you have the Knesset members. Under them, you have the 12 princes of the tribes of Israel. Under them, you have the people of Israel. And then you the, everyone connects back to the temple, to the Bet HaMikdash. And then you have all the nations of the world as well. My house will be a house of prayer for all nations. Yes. So this is the proper setup. This is, of course, um, Hashem is 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 enabling a, a, a chain reaction of circumstances uh, today in Israel. Tonight is actually the big night. Monday night is going to be the voting in the Knesset. Ooh. It's probably going to be overwhelmingly, uh, you know, right wing is going to just take the cake, completely reform the justice system. Yes. And no matter what the leftists can do and how much... You know, protests. But they cannot with... do anything. That's the whole point. Because they lost, and now after they finally lost, of course, um, you know they are trying to skip everything. You know, uh, basically destroy everything, but they can't. So you think it will? 100%. The law will pass. There will be a justice reform. Yes, if I'm not mistaken, it already passed in the Vadata Chuka in the Knesset in the room where I sat. It already passed. And, uh, you know, they were just kicking and screaming like a bunch of small children. It was actually pretty embarrassing. Yeah, I, the, I saw this. They were lying on the floor and the guards had to take them out. Absolutely ridiculous. It, it's so embarrassing that even though some of the Arabs want to help the left, they actually don't want any part of whatever they're doing. They don't want any part of the protest. They don't want to have any part of their, uh, you know, childish behavior. The whole thing is just uh, embarrassing, literally embarrassing. Yeah, it is really. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and uh, we, we see... So the next thing I think we should talk about is the... This week's Parsha is Mishpatim, which is... Yes. One of the things that has, that the Jews heard from Hashem out Mount Sinai, from Hashem's mouth, there was Ve'ela Mishpatim Hashem. These are the things that the Jews heard from Hashem, besides the Ten Commandments as well. So this is really, we're going from Shoftim, which is judges, into Mishpatim, which is laws. This parasha, um, and, and this is, of course, we see literally in, you know, in the Knesset in Israel, it's getting very intense. <laughs> yeah, I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, I really have to say, so I have here on the background, I have here this uh, Isaiah wall, which is actually uh, right opposite of the United Nations. You know, they shall beat their swords into plowshares. The vision of peace by the prophet Isaiah and of course Mika, you know, and um, it in includes uh, a, a judgment. It says he will judge the nations and then after the judgment, then they will, you know, transfer the sword into plowshares. And this, I think, is currently one of the most um, challenging issues where everybody is talking about war. I mean, we have, um, I just uh, found out that Biden suddenly, you know, appeared in, with at Zelensky. You know, we have the Munich Security Conference. Um, where it's basically, you know, all fight, you know, there are uh, Bill Gates, um, then the who guy, this Marxist from Tetris, Tetros Gebreyesus, and our socialist health minister. So they were meeting at the Munich Security Conference, you know, and saying, oh, we have a lot of pandemics coming on now. And uh, so we have to prepare the world now for the next uh, pandemics and, of course, the war against uh, Putin, this bad guy. So we are entering now the time of the four riders of the apocalypse. Hunger, pestilences, wars, and death. 
before the kingdom of Israel comes out? Or do you see? A, uh, yes, it's. Or do you see a very short-term peaceful solution to this whole issue? What's currently brewing? So I can say that when when the intifadas were starting to brew in Israel, the the Rebbe told Chabad Hasidim go out to every single Arab village and teach them the seven laws of Noah. And all the Arab villages that the Chabad were able to get to and and give out cards and papers and teach about the seven laws of Noah, they all made a decision not to be part of all the riots and all the terror attacks. And they just weren't part of it. They weren't buying the terror is going to fix the issue. And today we already know that there were all kinds of liberal leftist anti-Semites anti that were actually, you know, the white man actually going from, from <laughs> Arab village to Arab village. Yeah, they were going and they were bribing the heads of the community and they were actually convincing them and telling them that if you do more terror attacks, it's going to probably, you know, help your cause so the 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 arabs weren't the ones to come up with this whole terrorist uh, attack uh, style uh in israel that very much as, as far as today's research is concerned um so i believe that today um really people need to decide are they part of the the value system of bloodshed adultery yes. and uh, idol worship that's the value system. So for every time there's adultery, then the, the value goes up. And every time there's bloodshed, the military industrial complex, it goes up. And every time there's idol worship, it goes up. Or are we going to be part of the 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 Jewish value system, which is Torah, Avodah, the Gmilut Chastadim. Torah, which is the study of the Torah, Avodah, which, which is prayer or and preparing for the work, the service of the temple, and in our case, the Sanhedrin service, the Sanhedrin yes. services, which is the first step, um, and then Gemilut Chasadim is charity. Now, of course, um, today it might be very hard for people to decide how to give charity. You have to find the Rebbe says Zuch an Araman mit Licht. You have to look for a poor person with a candle. Like um, we're very happy that we have the Machatzit Hashekel. We actually know. Rabbi Erez in Israel, he's actually helping the poor. He's giving them food and actually helping them. Today, it's not even that easy anymore. Like you could give someone money and he's going to go use it to destroy himself even more. So it's very hard to find uh, charitable people and responsible people that are actually involved in this stuff, you know, and that's that's also very important. But of course, we have to give charity. We have to start, and I have to point this out off you know you're the nation of Ephraim has been amazing as far as supporting the Sanhedrin initiative and I, I have no words um you know to thank uh, everybody and, and all the efforts but of course we should always um not to forget our family and our friends and then our community and the bigger issues as well so we should well never forget the guys closest to us that's also very important in the laws of charity so yeah. coming back you know coming back to yeah, the can I kick something in kick, can I kick something in? Because as sure, we are here, sure. the kingdom of Israel is your headline. And of course, we should be a nation of priests, meaning everybody uh, within the nation, you know, is serving not only Hashem, but uh, through the service to Hashem, basically the world with their knowledge, with their expertise and so on and so on. And this is a big calling for all Israel, basically, you know, to be a light onto the nations. You know? A hundred percent. I believe that every every individual, if he's a Noahide or if he's a Jew, has a special um, uh, priestly mission that he can take upon himself if he so chooses to, and if he if he actually is capable um, to be a a mini mini light onto the nations in his area and uh, in his uh, immediate surroundings. You know, the Rebbe. The Rebbe would explain how, uh, you, you know, a Chabad Shliach can be anywhere in the world, you know, wherever he finds himself, even if he's there because of business or because of other issues or family. or So he should definitely use the, the, the this opportunity to spread light of Torah and Hashem. And of course, there's no such thing as a chance in this world. If, if Hashem puts you in a specific place, it means that you have a, 
a special shlichut, a special mes- mission to do there. You just have to find it, you know, to find the right people, the reason why you're, you're so unique and the situation you are is unique and why nobody else can can uh, have an impact on the people in that area like you do. So yeah. Definitely. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to this. So now... How do you think this um, initiative goes forward now in the in the Knesset? I mean, what are the chances now when we uh, really put our act together? Um, we said, you know, um, we currently uh, said so, so the first stage of the Sanhedrin initiative should be really to get a fixed team together, um, have an address and then permanently lobby actually all our Knesset guys and which of course is, is now if the justice reform should go through the uh, to have a Sanhedrin a Jewish court for the Jewish people I think this is uh, not something unreasonable I think you know I mean this should be the logical 100% after um, you know after now 2000 years in the Galut um, that now uh, in the first generation of the Geula, and I had to, you know, Rabbi Feld sent me um, an SMS, you know, in the meantime, I said, you know, some days ago, he said, hey, Ulf, you know, 30 years ago and 239 days ago. So the rabbi said the Geula already happens. And that he, I mean, this is what, what, where you draw all the authority, where you said, where the rabbi said, okay, I did everything I could, and now I, it's up to you. So in the moment, I think the, the rabbi passed, you know, he was the last person in the Galut. He never came to Israel. And you were born, and knew, you are now at least the first, if not the second generation of the Geula of the resurrection where you had, you were born and Israel was already in existence. You know, Jerusalem was already in existence. So all the other 2,000 years of persecution of things, you only knew, know from hearsay, like me. We only know from hearsay. When I was born, Jerusalem was captured and I came into Jerusalem already as a captured city in the hands of the Jewish people, historic. Yes. You know? But I believe that the, what's unique about what's unique about the Sanhedrin initiative and what we're busy doing on mmglobal.org with the scouting mission and the fundraiser and all this and the push and the, the visits that we have to the Knesset and to adding more advisors and all the rabbis in Israel and solidifying the Knesset. So first, yeah. uh, the, the Sanhedrin is really, um, first of all, there's two points here I want to point out. Number one, I do believe that in the coming uh, days or you know, in the next opportunity, I should be visiting the Knesset to congratulate the right wing on, uh, you know, this historic victory as far as their legislation and bringing a, a little bit of justice and light into the court systems. Of course, yes. it's going to take a little bit of time till it actually matters, but it's it's a slow process that's begun. Hopefully it'll be quicker, actually. But the point is, the real question that we that we have is, we're going to be checking to see again um, if the Knesset, if the right wing in, in the Knesset is ready for the Sanhedrin. Literally, are they ready? We have everything ready as far as we're concerned. We have a dozen advisors or more. We have uh, over five, you know, we have five judges or, or more. And uh, we're ready to roll. We have the framework. We have the the the, the unit, and uh, we just want to know if the Israeli government is ready to take it to the next step to actually make their small victory matter. That's step number one. Number two, I want to say regarding what you said about the Rebbe giving us license to to push this initiative, which is push for the Geula, push for the establishment of the Sanhedrin. So as you know. Uh, this past week, uh, we had our visitor from uh, advisor, Sean Lee, ultra-Orthodox yeah. Noahide from Texas, um, come visit. And uh, that was very interesting. We also had a visit with uh, uh, with uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Ariel Cohen Aloro. Yes. And, uh, Ariel Cohen Aloro, yes. And uh, un- unfortunately... As far as Jewish law is concerned, we still didn't tie the loose ends that he was trying to explain me. 
However, the theory that he explained me, I understood, I think, later, thinking back very, very well. He was explaining that it's almost very weird or very, very interesting why Christianity kind of tilts slowly into this, um, you know, practice of, of uh, drinking Jesus's blood and eating yeah. his flesh and why they have him strung up on the wall on a cross. So what's all this body business? What's all this, what's all this obsession about the body? And, and, uh, you know, as a Christian theologian, I might say, like Mr. Uh, Ariel Cohen Aloro, he basically explains that Asav is like his head is the only thing that's buried in Ma'arata Machpelah. So that's the only yeah. thing holy is his head. In other words, he gets the Torah, he gets it, but he never actually acts it out in his body. So his head ends up getting buried with the fathers, but his body is just left outside because he never purifies his body. However, there's another point to be made out here, which is that the Jewish people are like the soul and the nations are like the body. And as long as there's a fight between the body and the soul to, to come together, they really can't have the geula. They can't have the Yemot HaMashiach, the days of Mashiach experience. So he was basically saying that this is also why we see the nations of the world always having, I mean, not always, but inferior in the last 2000 years, success, even though they're not following Hashem. The reason is because they see Hashem in the lies. They see Hashem in the darkness. They see Hashem in the deception. They see Hashem in the evil. So when you appreciate your body so much so, Thank you, Hashem, for every minute of my body. So then, so then you connect to a certain energy of Hashem, and it and it surpasses or it doesn't actually register with actually trying to do good in the world. The issue with this conflict is, is that Hashem's light can never actually shine in this world because there's this conflict of, of the light not being expressed correctly. Of course, you need darkness in order to appreciate the light. Of course, you need death in order to appreciate life. You need lies in order to appreciate the truth and so on and so forth. However, if, if you're so obsessed with showing how much Hashem exists in the lies and you never actually bother to get to the truth, which is yes. the Torah and the lie, uh, lies are the, the New Testament narrative, so then, so then it's never going to happen. But then again, just like we, we started off with the uh, in the 14th uh, video that we had with the hookers. <laughs> yeah. Going back. So yeah, and it's uh, uh, now every time, you know, uh, things are coming up, you know, you go to you want to visit a website and so on. You know, I recognize now it's true. You want to go somewhere on the Internet, online, it doesn't matter. And all the time you have, you know, offers like hookers. Hey, no, do not go where you want to go. Go here. Click here. You know, check your time here. And it's uh, the hookers are everywhere. You know, so, the, you know, this is a, an example which will stick forever. I'm telling you, it's perfect. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, so continuing on that, really, Yaakov, this is a video that I put up um, um, on, uh, on our TikTok. I'll, I'll put a link in the description. But... Um, the point is that with, with Sean, when we went to the hot springs, we spoke about this because really this goes back to the point that Yaakov's specialty is never really experienced. It never actually shines unless Asov tries to check, check him out, you know, and yes. mess with him with all the hookers and everything. So really... So Edom and Esau and Rome, besides what we said last time, that their job is to create a perimeter and to and to allow the Torah to be spread to the whole world, to defend Yaakov in spreading the Torah. Yes. Besides that, there's another element. The other element is they need to understand that they are the contrast so that the light of Hashem shines. But they're also the body of Mashiach. This is what he was trying to say, which sounds very, very borderline... Uh, you know, you know, uh, proper Christian, but yeah, yeah I, uh, but he was, 
Yeah, I, I uh, you know, I, I saw many discussions of um, Ariel before, also with other uh, Orthodox rabbis who me tried to explain this. And then, of course, you know, he went into a topic nobody else wanted to touch. You know, and I think this is why he is in close contact, you know, under the supervision of Rabbi Ginsburg, you know, uh, because everybody knows it's a topic where it's uh, not very well received necessarily in the Orthodox community when it comes to Jesus and, you know, Asaph and how this is connected. You know, people just don't want to get into this. And he did. Right. And that's that's fine and i think that for a christian because he's coming in with biases regarding jesus it's very easy for him to just swallow up everything that mr uh, ariel coinaloro is saying um however as i said to him i actually he was a little bit shocked and confused when i told him you you never taught you you've been studying this for 30 years whatever and you never tied this back to the law like why didn't you tie it all the way back to the law you know, you, you stop, you stopped at the secrets of the Torah. You just didn't continue. You you should have, or the gematria or the numerical values yes. and, you know, the numbers and the stuff and the mazals and all that, but you never, you, you need to go a little bit more and tie it back to the law, because if it's not the law, then why are you wasting time? You know, everybody has great ideas. So, but the, I definitely, I appreciate the understanding because again, he says that the, there needs to be a body and a soul and the body needs to accept the soul, and the soul needs to accept the body. Um, so there's definitely something over there, and I definitely understand that. And, and even in the Torah, it basically says, honestly, it says that the, the nations of the world are going to be the Jewish people's slaves. But what that really means is that the Jewish people are not going to be involved in the world. They're literally not going to take care of anything. They're not going to be building yeah, buildings. They're not going to be. Also, the whole idea of, uh, you know, a slave or bond, a bond servant, you know, in biblical times, it's a complete different idea. What we think today as a white master with a whip and uh, black slaves who are picking cotton, you know, to, to do this, you know, it's. Uh, yes. Uh, and a lot of people already realize, oh, wait a second, we are slaves already. You know, we are slaves already. We are slaves to the system. You know, we are, you know, a person. So people know already that they're slaves to the financial system already. And I think, you know, for some people, they prefer, they said, what? You are going to Israel. Listen, you know what? I can, I work for you. I do whatever. Just take me with you. You know, I will follow you everything, mm -hmm. you know. It's like the master, you know, like the uh, you know the servant who likes his master so much that at one point he puts his ear on the doorpost, he puts a, a flock in there and said, no, I like my master. And I really believe that, you know, <laughs> taking a look at the social system, a lot of people, they don't want to think for themselves. It's not bad, you know, they are totally happy if they are under a boss, under somebody, who's telling them, you know, and they're happy with what they have in their portion of life. Oh, you know, that's, that actually brings up a good question. You know, if someone pays taxes and he's too, too religious about, about the government and he, and he pays all of his tickets and he, and he, you know, everything that they say, he just, he, even though he knows it's not just, and he's not going to get justice from the courts and he's not going to, it's not going to work. But if he takes the government too seriously, after seven years, should he get a hole in his ear to remind him that Hashem said, you are my servants and not servants to other servants? The yes. real question is, you know, maybe we should start giving a, a, a you know, an earring package where, where people that are saying, oh, we're so scared of the government that everything they say, we listen to them. And, uh, you know, we, we should be like, uh, Hashem says to the Jews, I took you out of Egypt. I took you out of Egypt. You are my slaves. So all the Jewish people right now are slaves. Absolutely. The only issue is that the nations are not yet slaves. Now Hashem says, I took you out of Egypt. I freed you in order. And Hashem doesn't stand around with a whip. Just like you said, it's all free choice. I freed you. And the only reason Hashem wants us to be his slaves is so that no new age pharaoh is going to come by walking along and say oh i'm taking these guys so hashem says no these are my guys they're keeping shabbat they're keeping kosher they're keeping the seven laws of noah they're my slaves 
So when in continuation to what you said, it's not about the whip. It's not the cotton field. We're talking about serving Hashem as servants, as slaves, it's and a, um, it's a holy and nation. That's the that's the dream. That's the dream. You know, absolutely, a, a holy nation, absolutely. And I think you know, I was uh, with uh, um, Rabbi Saklas, you know, in Zagreb. You know, introduced him uh, the Sanhedrin Initiative, and he was also very appreciative. You know, he said it's really expanded his mind. You know, to see that, you know, in a time so here in Croatia, there are not, uh, you know, that many Jewish people. There are like about perhaps like 3,000 or so in all Croatia. Um, you know, and hardly anybody has, a, even they do not have a real root or culture or anything about Judaism. You know, uh, so they're very secular. Also here. So, and it's also here, you know, um, and I found this very interesting that he said, you know, that um, that uh, the Chabad, you know, in the future will be the foremost organization in the world representing, uh, representing the Jewish people against anybody else because of the type of Judaism, because of the type of, you know, how they basically, you know, take care of their people, you know, in wherever they are, you know. And um, so he was, of course, extremely amazed, you know, that, uh, you know, and, exp uh, and explained him also. He said, yeah, we are, you know, um, basically everywhere throughout Europe. And there is a, a group of guys. Yes, you know, we are not, uh, we are not Jews. Absolutely. We're not from the Jewish people, but we are from the nation. A lot of people say they're from Joseph. And we have the same drive to keep the Torah. You know, and it's a natural partnership. And for him, it's like, you know, it was the first time I really think, you know, to even realize that an organization like the nation of Ephraim and we are what we are doing even exists, you know. And I think, you know, um, and, and I really, you know, so when now this whole drive, you know, also from us out of the nations, you know. So in Israel, it's the first time that you have a right wing majority. And the left freaks out. The left freaks out. Now, the same left which freaks out in Israel is the same left which freaks out in Germany, which freaks out in America, and so on and so on. Now, outside Israel, um, the Jewish people, just by the numbers, just by the numbers, it's uh, uh, tiny, tiny. You, you are, we, you know, orthodox, uh, ultra-orthodox Noites, and orthodox, uh, orthodox Jews, they currently, outside Israel, have not a majority. They will be, uh, you know, in a democracy, you know, with their values, they will over, always overrun, um, always. So, but I really believe, you know, when we grab now the nations, where we are, you know, where, uh, you know, the, uh, wherever we sit, wherever we sit, and we start now the cooperation for the Sanhedrin and really teach from our side, our constituency, you know, guys which are coming from the church, you know, they suddenly find something out, the people waking up from the two, I don't care. Everybody who is not Jewish, we said, okay, we will be the first and foremost guys where we try to take care of all the non-Jews and explain this to them, how important this is, how important after 2000 years of confusion, of uh, Greece, of Greek philosophy, after 2000 years of Rome, after Christianity, that it's now the most important thing that according to the Jewish people, you know, that Jerusalem is regulated and then, you know, the temple becomes a house of prayer for all nations. I think this is the biggest initiative for peace anybody can think of. A hundred percent. Oh, if I want to say that... Um... For many, many generations, you had, uh, especially during, let's say, for example, the rise of the Ottoman Empire, um, you had a, a period of time when, and this is now they just made a, vi a, a movie series about the Ottoman Empire, a very nice series. Um, and they, the, people, when the Muslims and the Christians were fighting back in the day in the 1400s, they both assumed that God was on their side. Yes. And... Today, I think that with all the information that's available, you see that the, the the wisest of the nations all over the world are saying, 
forget about everything we thought, forget about Christianity, forget about Islam. The Jewish people are fulfilling the Torah word for word for word for word. Um, you know, like this is literally the 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 fulfillment of prophecy. Yes. You know, just stop it. Stop it with all the BS. If you were able to to uh, put together a crusade to go fight a holy war and give them holy water and promise them, you know, heaven, and and you, you mixed up you mix yes, them you up with some blood moon. Yeah, with a blood moon and a this and a that, and you drove them up a creek and down a river. Today, when you have all the information open and available, I think that really the Jewish um, initiative of creating the of, of fulfilling the prophecies in Eretz Israel in the Holy Land, I think that is the the most purest, correct thing that we know of. And and I admit we don't see miracles today, unfortunately, for the most part. Um, we have a very great Helen Vahester, a very great um, hiding of Hashem's glory today. We don't have it revealed. And, and during the prayers that we pray in, in the Jewish prayers, we actually, we're actually, you know, kind of hoping and wishing and begging Hashem to be revealed in this world. That's kind of the wishful thinking that, that Hashem will take our and it should always be for your will the work and the service of Israel, your nation. So in other words, by fulfilling the commandments, by establishing a Sanhedrin, adding shoftim, judges, and adding mishpat, justice, yes. into the world, and by anointing a king in order to be able to eradicate Amalek and build the third temple, and to fulfill the 613 commandments, which were only now fulfilling 87, which is nothing. It's zero potential. It's a, not even a sixth potential of spiritual and physical yes. blessing from Hashem. So we're literally that little. And now we need to push when we're doing those commandments and we're pushing for what Hashem actually wants. When we're listening to the Rebbe and the Rebbe says, everything I've done is lahevel velorik. It's for nothing. It's for spit. And I want you guys now to do something in the realm of Kabbalah's Pnei Mashiach, greeting, accepting, welcoming Mashiach. So when the Rebbe gives us that initiative, and we, you know, we had the, 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 the unfortunate, you know, you know, disappearance of the Rebbe. So now we have time to focus on what the Rebbe actually said. Listen to what actually the Rebbe was saying, and not just get caught up in the hype. And the Rebbe says, "I need you guys to do this stuff, the stuff, the, the commandments that are connected to Mashiach. Focus on that, and you'll have your geula." And when there, so if we can do that, and and it all starts according to halacha, according to Jewish law, according to what the Rambam says, with establishing a Sanhedrin, then we can also hope that Hashem sees that and is revealed more and more in the world. Absolutely. But not to confuse, not to confuse the commandments that we need to do with theoretical prayer. In other words, you can't pray to keep kosher. You can't pray, <laughs> you know, you can't wait for Hashem to throw, yes. you know, yes. to throw a cow <laughs> through the window, you know, like, when am I going to start keeping kosher? I need a sign from God, you know, <laughs> maybe, maybe a cow flies through the, the kitchen window. Then I know that yeah. it's a, it's, it's a sign that I should keep kosher, you know? So, so the, um, so establishing uh, a king, yeah. Yeah, I really, you know, I, it was so funny, you know. We, of course, you know, when uh, we've been in uh, um, in Zagreb with uh, with Pin, uh, Rabbi Pini, you know, he said, okay, so um, how about you know, is it an option that basically all our community, you know, the nation of we all become Orthodox Jews? And I said, okay, this was the first thing I said, okay, uh, okay, how many, uh, how many of the 613 mitzvot are you able to do? So now I hear, okay, 87, okay, 87. So now with my lifestyle already, you know, I keeping more mitzvot than all my liberal Jewish friends who do not keep kosher, who do not keep the Sabbath, who do not pray the fast, you know? So I'm more Jewish already than them. So so now how is this possible? You know, how should I now tell my constituencies, okay, 
all right, now we become all Orthodox Jews, but in, uh, it's like the liberal Jews, they, also, they, they don't do this, so it doesn't make sense. I said, but what makes sense is when we go and strive to really fulfill everything, and we have to accept as we are, you know, and I, uh, you know, this is what um, uh, Avram Feld also said, you know, for generations of generations, nobody was able to fulfill the commandments because we were not in Israel, because we were not in the land. We didn't have, uh, you know, a, a sovereignty over the capital. Uh, there, there were no people living there. There had anybody. There was no Tel Aviv. You know, there was no Tel Aviv. So all, everybody was in the Galut, uh, was dispersed, and so on and so on. But now, I think, you know, this was, uh, you know, this is why I started the word from Jerusalem and so on. When I take a look, okay, what can we do? Nobody was able to do before us. You know, and then we slowly, we found out and said, hey, listen, eight, here like uh, when um, Alexander and Patrick, they came to you. So, you know, the commandment, blow the shofar in Zion. I mean, think about how often generations of generations of people died. They were never able to even go up to Jerusalem, regardless if they had a shofar or not. But now you can do it. And now think about this to literally fulfill this commandment. Okay, blow the shofar and die. And how many people all did this actually? How many did this? You know? And I think, you know, when we start finally out and come up, we said, okay, this is how the Sanhedrin is put to together. And we find out new things nobody did before. In the moment we did it, now then we can show other people to do it too. And it becomes more 100%. and more full. It becomes more and more full, you know. And I think it's a very big. Uh, and I told you know, I said, um, you know, it's yes, you know, we there is absolutely, you know, we need the rabbis, the Orthodox Jewish people, because of their their Torah they kept for two thousand years. But you also need guys like us who have a spiritual Torah who came from a completely from a you know who uh, Hashem also gave gifts. You know, who came from a completely different uh, angle. You're not not from the traditions of the fathers, but because they awake, went to Israel, came into contact with the Jewish people, saw what's happening, and then said, "Okay, of course I do." It's a logical. So, Ulf, you know, that's one of the thing. One of the reasons why the Torah was given in the middle of the desert was so that there should be no copyright claim to the Torah. In other words, yeah, 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 literally like that. That's literally what the sages tell us is that the reason the Torah was given in the desert was so that nobody should say this is our Torah and that the Torah should always be open to having an impact and be a light onto the entire world. So I join you in that. You know, Dr. Traveler also says that, told me back in the day that uh, the seven laws of Noah, if you open them up, they re really bring you to the whole Torah. It's just a different path, like we said, to get into and get involved in these things. And of course, even the Jew the whole point of the Jewish people is to be a light unto the nations. And you think about, okay, what's the next step? You know, it's like the <laughs> yeah, it's like the joke with the uh, you know, with the, yeah, but with uh, the uh, what's it called? With the Jehovah Witnesses when they come into the guy's house and the guy's like, Okay, you guys want a tea? And then they say, oh, actually, we never made it this far, right? <laughs> so when the Jewish people, so when the Jewish people um, actually are a light unto the nations, the next step is the nations being, okay, we're ready to fulfill the Torah, you know? And then the Jewish people are going to be like, no, 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 only we fulfill the Torah. <laughs> like, you know, so what do you want us to do? Kill and steal? Like, what's, what's the deal, you know? What's the deal? Kill and steal? You know, so... So at that point, we really need to, as the Jewish people, really need to think to themselves, you know, is it going to hurt you if everybody... Now, the only thing, of course, is the Jewish people love to be special. Now, if too many people are keeping the Torah, they might not feel as special as they used to, you know? Yeah, but if everyone's you know, serving the Jewish Hashem. people will find out, you know, that the, you know, the light unto the nation, well, this is the Moshiach. The Moshiach will be the light unto the... And when you read this in Isaiah 49, it's talk about one person and not the, the Jewish people. 
You know, I like they are always also, you know, I also know in contrary, you know, Isaiah 53, the suffering servant. I also heard, yeah, it's the Jewish people, you know. Um, so there, are, God deals with individuals, individuals. And I think, you know, um, he gave us these prototypes, you know, like Jacob. And in each of us is definitely a Jacob. And then it's just the question, okay, from what mother's side are you on? You know, are you more like the, you know, stay at home guy, the dreamer, you know, Joseph? Or, you know, are you, you know, like Levi, Levi or <laughs> Simeon going yeah, Simon out, and killing Levy. people, <laughs> killing people? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, so I always imagine, you know. Yeah, oh, you know, we should we should have on the two, that's the hood, which... Which tribe do you identify as? Yeah, yeah. You know, forget about what is genders. Your you know? what, what is your tribal pronoun? <laughs> you want... Yeah, what's your tribal pronouns? Dan Dan or Zvulan Zvulan, you know? <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, I talked with uh, Hubert before, you know, our uh, the chairman here of our NGO, and I said, listen, you know, what happened, you know, we were wondering why in the world is it that there is, you know, in the Germans, in, in Germany, okay, there is this deeply rooted, completely unexplainable anti-Semitism. We experience, you know, everybody else experience, and I mean, to a point where you say, okay, what's wrong with the guys, you know? So what we actually came up, I said, we, we came up with a theory, this is a, a theory, you know, I think that in the last days, in the last days, Okay, like the Germans are the basically the culmination of Ephraim and the heathen. Because after the split between uh, Solomon and uh, Rehoboam, you know, Solomon lost the kingdom, so Jeroboam took over. Now, the first thing what they did, is we said, you know what? We put up signs. Don't buy from Jews. You know, do not go to Jerusalem, do not go to, and do not pay the taxes to these tax collectors, you know, because they wanted to raise the taxes. So and I thought, so why, so the, so Ephraim became now basically a competitor towards the Jewish people. So the Jewish people, Judah had the temple, the temple service, um, you know, and basically Hashem. So now, you had the northern kingdom, Israel, they said, no, no, we make now competitors, we start a new priesthood, we take other priests, and then we change the altar service. And then we tell everybody, do not go to the Jewish people, because, uh, you know, blah, 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 come to us, you know, come to Shiloh, come to Tel Dan, and do our thing. So this trade, this trade, having a different priesthood, and a false altar service, is completely prevalent in Christianity. That you suddenly have a priest who says, yeah, look at this, I even wear a keeper. <laughs> I even wear a keeper. And what we do now, we do the sacrifice and we, but it's not the real deal. It's a completely copycat. And they mumbo jumbled it this in this mixture from Roman mythology, but a complete different altar service, a different, um, you know, a, a different priesthood and completely anti-Semitic. No, you want to do something with Jerusalem? No, 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 definitely not. We are the real guys. And this is so much, I think, in the soul of Ephraim. You know, this is, and, you know, I take, take a look now in all the world nations. I've been to all kinds of nations. And I think, well, the Germans are there. This is, a, you know, they are like uh, the heathens. It's like totally idol worshiper. They listen to the latest bullshit. You know, now they fall for climate change and whatnot, you know, and Corona. They fall for all of this. You know, it doesn't matter. Whatever you tell them, they, they fall for this. And, the, you know, I take a look in the Bible and I see, Ben, this is like the trade of Ephraim. You know, like this thick, uh, thick cookie, you know, not really turned, limping on one side. A prostitute, you know. I mean, when we talk about hookers, you know, Ephraim is the only guy who was called a hooker. Why? We, because he was, uh, you know, hooked up to other foreign gods. You know, and in this end time, I... The microphone is out. The microphone is out. 
אני לא שומע. There, there. So, who gave Ephraim, or in our case, the Christian church, the audacity to set up, you know, the snake oil scheme, to put together an altar, like you said, to put together a whole little shop and call it spirituality. You know, the Jewish people, if you open a prayer book, you know, some people might say, you know, what's the difference between Judaism and all the other religions, you know? There, we don't see God falling out of the sky, like it says in the Torah, you know, splitting of the sea. So, you know, the Islams, they pray, they, the Christians pray, the Jews pray, right? But if you actually open up a Siddur, yeah, we say, Because of our sins, we have been exiled from our lands, and we are, uh, and we are distant from our from the earth, from our land, and we cannot serve Hashem the way we used to. Yes. In other words, in the, in, the, in the prayer service, we basically say, yes, it's true. We cannot serve Hashem right now the way we should. This is pretty sad. It's because, and of course, the Jewish people never say that it's Hashem's fault for what happened. They always take responsibility for what, what happens to them, even if it's not their fault. So every time somebody comes and kills the Jews, they start to repent to God. They never actually blame the person who's actually punishing them. They always say, maybe Hashem is talking to us. You know? This is why they actually, the, the, the uh, Haskalah movement and the, the secular movement actually got pissed off at a certain point. They're like, you know what? Screw this. We're making you know, the Zionist country. We're going to get a military. We're going to put a nuclear bomb. And if anybody touches us, we're going to blow them to shreds. You know, so, so on one hand, you have this very, very, very strong faith in Hashem by the, by the ultra-Orthodox Jewish, uh, you know, communities for thousands of years. And on the other hand, you have these guys that are like, come on, let's be real. You know, we need a few tanks and a few nuclear bombs to protect the Jewish people. You know, how, how is Hashem going to address the miracle in nature if we don't give him something to work with? But what I'm trying to say is, is that we don't claim... to be doing something. We actually claim that we need the temple to be built in order to hopefully maybe have Hashem have mercy on us and come back to this degenerate world. Yes. So whereas if you go to the church or the way Islam talks, it sounds almost like they have it all figured out. And I'm like, what are you talking about? The world is in a free fall into chaos. Yes. spiritual, everything. How could you say that you have it figured out with Hashem? And, and of course, just the, just the thought of putting together another, uh, you know, this is the same issue that Korach had. Rich guy, very good with strategy, very good with, you know, marketing and all the good stuff, know how to make a millions of dollars in his time. He was gone. But then he, at a certain point, he forgets that Hashem is part of the game. So the same thing, huh? Yeah, and Shwopi was gone. <laughs> so the same thing as the Christian church. They put together a whole shop. They put together a whole thing. And they think that they have it all figured out. But if, you, if you're running on your, you know, we have the same thing in the, actually in the Torah. Interestingly, Moshe did not say it's time to leave Egypt yet. And half of the tribe of Menashe decided we're going to leave Egypt before the time is up. Now, what was the problem? What's wrong with leaving Egypt before the time is up? Because Hashem told Avraham Avinu, your children will be slaves for X amount of time. And that is set in stone. That is part of the way Hashem, you know, that's a prophecy. That's the way it is. You try to leave before, it's going to be a problem, you know. So Menashe doesn't listen to the leader of the generation. They leave Egypt early and they all get killed. They all die in the desert. And Moses has to make a detour. very big detour in order that the rest of the Jewish people don't see the, the bones of Menashe all up in the desert. Yeah, the bodies. So, so on that note, we see that just as important as it is to be ready to act and ready to go and this and this and that, we have to always tie everything back down to the law. We have to tie it back down to what Hashem is actually saying. And we have to be able to see, put our, our biases aside And actually go back to the halacha, to the Jewish law, look, see what's up, and, and, and go with that. You, you know, of course, 
Christianity is so far from Jewish law that I don't even, you know, I can't even address it really. But yeah. yeah uh, I mean, Christianity has nothing to do with uh, Jewish law. I mean, I can vouch for this, you know. And I mean, this, uh, uh, this was one of the um, best, you know, quotations here in um, one of the last interviews Adam Berkowitz mit, made with this professor or whatever. Um, that he said, no, Judaism, well, this is the religion and this was the belief of Jesus. But Christianity now is a religion and the belief in Jesus. So it's a complete system. So Christianity, the belief in one Jew. You know, I always said this also in our conversation. I said, yeah, this is one of the biggest issues that basically 2.5 billion Christians, Jesus is the only Jew they know. So when they five figure out now a real Jew doing what Jesus did, they totally freak out by because that's not what everybody else is doing. And this is a big issue. This is a big issue. You well, know? You, know, you know what I'm thinking? I can imagine like in Times Square on New Year's Eve, they could have like a, a big glass room, you know, a glass room. And they could have a guy dressed like Jesus with a beard and, a, and covering his head. And he's just making kiddush, lighting Shabbat candles, sitting around with his family. Instead of having like, a, a, you know, the doll, they have like a doll of baby Jesus with, in, in a, with a bunch of hay next yeah. to the donkey of Bilam or something. I'm not sure what's going on over there. There's a lot of things going on. I'm not sure. But anyway, I, so, so instead of doing all that, we could just have... <laughs> You know, yeah. You see, oh, the, 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 one of the perks of being an ultra orthodox Noahide and following all of our uh, Effie and Rabbi uh, Torah classes is that you get some of the jokes that I slide yes, in. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So, so you can have like a glass room, and you literally have Jesus, you know, making kiddush on Shabbat. You know, yom mashishi, just like you know, every Jew does every week. And I can imagine, like, all the Christians looking in the box. Yes. Oh, look at Jesus. What's he doing? You know? Ah, maybe we should also do that, you know? And all of a sudden, like, Alibaba, AliExpress is getting orders for, like, Kiddush cups and Shabbat candles. And, like, because some Christians are, you know, it's like, you, you want to give them the whole Judaism. You want to give them the Torah. They're like, wait, 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 wait. That's way too much. Just give us one Jew that we could look at and observe. And and by mistake worship sometimes, but yeah, but it's a, I mean, against us. I mean, you know? and then a we'll, very we'll, clever we'll, issue. This was we'll study what he does, and then we'll slowly take ideas. You know, I think we'll take notes. Very we'll take notes clever, from what the Jew is doing. Yeah, I think it was from God. It was a pretty clever idea. You know, for I, you know, I told this, uh, you know, on here, uh, Jeremy Gimple, Jeremy Gimple. You know, before he became a rabbi, so now he is a rabbi and he has this agora farm. You know, in the Judean history. <laughs> Um, and this Israel network. So, um, so one day he comes, you know, hey, Ulf, you know, I, you know, we met us at the International Christian Embassy at the feast, you know, they have like this marketplace and one way we were discussing it, he came to me and said, yeah, Ulf, you know, uh, it's very nice that all these Christians are here, you know, but what, why do they have to missionize? What's with the missionizing? And I said, Jeremy, don't ask me. Listen, I, I'm, just a, I, I'm just from, you know, I, I read that this guy is a Jew. You know, Jesus was a Jew. And I read that all the other guys, they were also Jews. So please don't blame me. Somebody told the other guy and I heard it and just came here. So <laughs> do check out. So and he never saw this that way, you know. And so now it makes like totally sense because, you know, after the destruction of the second temple, um, the Jewish people stick to themselves. They kept the generation, you know, they were first they had to codify the, the law. They, you know, here, uh, Rabbi Z um, Yochanan ben Zakai, you know, when he went down to Yafne, they had to bring in the first council. They had to decide, okay, what's in the codex of the Old Testament, of the Tenach. So then you had after Rabbi Akiva, you know, the Tanaim and so on, who would put together the Mishnah. And then later on the Talmud. You know, so they were totally into. So, oh, my gosh, you know, the temple destroyed Alice Kaput. We cannot do the mitzvot anymore. They were busy with surviving. Now, in the meantime, so suddenly the Goyim started to talk about this Jew. 
And now 2000 years later, you know, now after 2000 years, the Jewish people are back and now everybody is still talking about this Jew. So don't tell me this is not made by God. So now what you did from this Jew, you know, should I worship this, blah, 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 forget this all. But just the idea that now 2.5 billion Christians wait for a Jew to return to become the Moshiach on Mount Zion. And the only people who are actually capable of making decision who it is, you know, who is the Shilu at the end of the day, where well, these are the Jewish people. You have the scepter, you have the lawgiver until Shilu comes. And I think it's, you know, um, you know, I just was born 1967. You know, I was born after the Second World War. I just know that we were born into a situation which was created by our forefathers and we were kicked into yes, off you know i i think that uh, it's actually going to be a very a very interesting day i can imagine like the day when the sanhedrin is officially you know recognized by the knesset and then you have like uh, finally after immense pressure to open up the gates to decide who could be a candidate for mashiach the sanhedrin says okay we're ready to take Candidates and applications. Sign up this year. You know, and then you have all these guys from all over the world coming in, and then you know the Sanhedrin asks them a few questions. You know, there's that, and then they're like, "No, so am I, Mashiach?" And the guy's like, "No, I, I, you, you don't have enough problem." He's like, uh, you know what, you guys, you know. <laughs> You guys just don't like the way my nose is, you know. <laughs> you, know you guys are racist. And they're like, it's going to be, I think they should make a TV show about that all, you know. And all the candidates. And this is, <laughs> you know, uh, this is what I told you. Know, I left this actually as a commentary. You know, I sent two guys to Ariel Alou, you know, Carl Cohen Alou, like seven, seven, over uh, seven years ago, you know. So these two, while I had to go back at the border, so they went, you know, two days, three days later, they met Ariel and spent a lot of time. And I told him from the beginning, listen, you want to do a retrial of Jesus? Do it as a TV show. Sell the rights, you know, sell the rights. You have like this rabbis and so on. You want to have term two million men. Who doesn't want to see this? Pay TV. Get a sponsor. This is what I wanted to talk to him. And I think today, you can do crazy stuff like this. Now, in the moment you, you do this as a TV show, you have the <laughs> licensing rights, you have the licensing rights, you, have, you know, you have the cloud and you have, you have content. You see, you have content. Because... And, I mean, and as far as we're concerned, it's, it's education because the, 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 the truth of the Torah absolutely. is being spread to the world. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Very important, you know, um, Rabbi Feld, you know, I wanted, uh, you know, I uh, put him together now with David and I would be absolutely super duper happy, you know, if you... Well, if I, I'm, I'm actually concerned about making a TV show like this because you're going to, you need to have like <laughs> the swap on standby with a psychologist and, you know... Yes, 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 so yes. But this is, you know, Hollywood... It's going to be pretty... Crazy. Hollywood movie industry, they can pay for this. Seriously. They have now here the Sam Spiegel Film Foundation or what's film school. They are um, having now a Netflix deal. They are educating um, TV series uh, producers and so on. So you go and it's a, uh, it's a, you know, it's a film school, downtown Jerusalem. So we should work with the, that. Oh, you know, you know what I'm thinking about, you know, no. the question is, you know, when they have like these um, uh, videos where it's like survival, you know, and yeah. then they like, they raffle off like a small piece of bread, you know, for like a lot of money. So later, and you know, they tell the guys that the reason why everybody's going crazy for like a little bit of food is because they don't let them eat for like two days before, you know, like they, they really <laughs> they want to get a good show, you know, so they like, they starve them. Like, oh, like I, I'm just, I'm just saying the advisory board's gonna need to be making sure that whoever buys the rights for the for the Sanhedrin and you know checking for the Mashiach and stuff like that, 
that they don't like, you know, these guys are coming straight, you know, fresh out of the mental home. You know, they want to get signed no, up. No, no, <laughs> but wait, what I'm no, saying. Wait a minute. No, I'm saying like, of course, you're going to have normal people, but you're also going to have people that they're going to be like, Maybe we should skip their medication for a few days okay. <laughs> to get a I better film, you know, to get a better shot, you know, better, uh, uh, what do you call it, better reaction, you know. <laughs> so we have to be careful about that, you know, we have to be careful. Yes. As an ethical board, we have to make sure that there's no monkey business, you know. Yes. It's okay to have a little bit of fun, but we can't do it on the, on the uh, yeah, expense of the poor people. That just, they just want to be Mashiach, you know. Yeah, but nevertheless, okay. The whole issue with the Sanhedrin, uh, you know, with the retrial of Jesus and so on. You know, I think it would be awesome to have this as a TV thing, you know, with the real guys who are doing this, a producer or producing this, who could do this according to Jewish law. And then I'm 100% sure, you know, when you say, okay, we need two million bucks for this. Well, you can raise that fund. Absolutely. Now. Um, so Rabbi Feld already said, and the, um, it's really sure, uh, it's absolutely sure, you know, that at this moment, at this very moment, we do not have a Sanhedrin. And we should really tell this everybody. So as of now, there are people who feel responsible, you know, a responsibility towards God and man. And they are filled with the spirit. They said, okay, we want to do this to bring peace to the world and to be, uh, put the uh, Beta Mikdash and so on and so on. And I think this has to be understood that it's an issue of the heart of many people who says, no, Hashem is king. And the only way how Hashem's kingdom is uh, come into this world is by doing his laws. And the Sanhedrin is part of this, you know. Um, a hundred percent. So yes. So whoever we're right now, let me let me let me continue from where you left off. Right now on MN Global MashiachNewsGlobal.org, MN Global MashiachNewsGlobal.org, uh, we have the fundraiser for the Sanhedrin Initiative Scouting Mission campaign. We are going through Israel. We already did. Uh, one second. Five days. Five days of. Uh, of uh, you know scouting, scouting, the scouting mission. Mission. you've been in the Knesset, um, you've been in a super interview at Fahabat. Um you yes, we, per, we visited the Knesset, we visited Rabbi. rabbis, we're visiting yes, um we've visited uh, rabbis, advisors, you know, you know, Rabbi uh, Mr. Aloro uh, uh, from Fahabad, this uh, Emilio Edry, my grandfather, and we and we have added advisors like Adam Sharon and so on. We have added judges like the chief rabbi of Japan, Rabbi Binyamin Yecheskel Edery. So we are doing a lot of work. We visited the Knesset. Yes. We, we are just going back and forth in Israel, and we're just letting everybody know what's happening, checking who's available. So whoever wants to support us can do so. We have a lot of gold and silver coins we're giving out. Um, for those who support the Sanhedrin initiative, of course, you could also donate through the Nation of Ephraim. Um, oh, if you can tell the people uh, about that. Yes, um, of course, you know, we um, have, of course, our, our normal channel, of course, templecoin.org. Um, we have right now, as we have here our Zoom call, we have our digital soldiers on Fora Club. So it's an um, absolutely perfect uh, opportunity perhaps also you know uh, Joseph when you put on later the video on your channel you know provide a link to our free Torah club community you know where people really I mean it's our wish you know that people are connecting that they are completely uh, free of any uh, prejudice and come together to find the will of Hashem to make the world a better place, as you like to say this, study the Torah together and follow up on this uh, Sanhedrin initiative. You know, so this is uh, the best place to start on Torah Club for those who are already advanced. You know, we ask, you know, to become members of the nation of Ephraim, you know, part of the society of the heirs of Jacob. And we vouch and we signed off that we said, okay, we continue on the path of Torah until a peace between Ephraim and Judah is reached, as written in the prophets. And, um, you know, to support in the meantime, 
you know, the Jewish leadership, you know, I submitted here to Rabbi Feld already years ago. I said, okay, guys, you know, we need definitely the rabbi, uh, the rabbis, you know, in application of Jewish law. There is absolutely no doubt about it that we are a bit behind on some of the Torah issues you know, that develop, where there is an incredible input we can give, you know, nobody else can give. And I told also Rabbi Saklas, you know, it's much better when I stay in ultra-Orthodox Noite until everything is said and done. Because in my position as a former member of the church and so on and so on, I can say things to my Christian brothers you cannot say. It's impossible. Correct. But, you know, but yeah. in, the, in, the, in the same time, when we uh, when we agree, no, this is a corporation and I'm, uh, you know, 100% all in, you, so to speak, I said, I can go out, you know, for that Sanhedrin initiative as an advisor and can say things and contact people which are completely out of reach for the Jewish people currency. So I think this is a huge uniting factor by handing people a share in this whole initiative. Because we said, okay, we are not there. We are at the process of negotiating a new deal. Because currently we have only 87, I put this down, instead of 613. And there needs to be a systematic teaching, cooperation, understanding, working together to reach our final goal, you know? And, you know, to 100%. have a house of prayer for all nations, you know, it's something where it says, you know, we are the first generation who are really able to do it. It was never, ever before possible. And in Hashem's word, it says nothing will impossible to us. Wherever we put our mind to, we can reach. And because it's possible and because Hashem puts this in our heart, I believe we can do this in our lifetime. You are a young guy. I'm a super young guy. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Fin finish and, uh, and I'll... That's and it. I'll, and I'll... Okay, we can do so this in our young guys and we can finish it in our lifetime. This, I think, very important. For everybody who is joining the Sanhedrin Initiative, we are in there for the long run. We are not there for the quick cash. We are not in there. We have both a track record of years and years and years of living the Torah, studying the Torah, and teaching the Torah. So we are no, not a one-night fly. Yes. Um, so here we have... Uh, so this week's Parsha is Parsha's Mishpatim. I just want to go through uh, a few uh, of the laws. It says... Elokim lote kalel. This is uh, chapter four. Ravi. Uh, uh, cha uh, chapter chav zayin. Chav zayin is uh, twenty-seven. Uh, no, sorry. Chapter twenty-two, verse twenty-seven. Uh, Parshat Shemot, the second book. Elokim lote kalel. God, you shall not curse. And a Nasi, a leader in your nation, you shall not uh, or. let's see what that means. I guess also like say say like something inappropriate. One second, let's see. Uh, uh, oh, you shall not, you're not allowed to curse a judge. This is Elokim Lotekalel. Elokim also goes on uh, on uh, Hashem himself. And of course, also a warning not to curse a judge. This is um, the Talmud brings this down from uh, Sanhedrin and Samach uh, So, okay, so we have that. And then we have before Banecha Titubli. So we have here the concept of the firstborn, which yes. is for Hashem, of course, again, also redeemed by the Kohen. Yeah, this is, uh, uh, this is actually one of the issues, you know, we should, uh, we already said this is, you know, one of the perfect issues for the priestly, uh, you know, priceless in temple coins. 
because every time yes. you redeem your firstborn, you have to, you know, pay a certain amount of silver, and you, you know, so it's a basically Kohanim price list. This is one of the first issues, you know, the Sanhedrin initiative, you know, should come up with very practical. What is the price list? For example, I wanted to have, uh, you know, my daughter made a vow. And it says, you know, when uh, your daughter is doing a vow and the father does not consent to it, well, he should make an offering to the priest, go there, pay, um, and that this um, covenant is uh, loose. So there is a priestly price list. And this is one of the first practical applications. Um, you know, we talked about, for example, the uh, houses, you know, when there is like the mushrooms in the houses, where the house is sick. You know, and you have like, uh, you know, like a, a chimney service. You have a service for the house when there is, uh, you know, fungus and stuff like this. It's a priestly job. And there should be some sort of, you know, a price list for everybody who wants to have these services. You know, and especially the redemption of the firstborn. Now, this is something, you know, Ariel Cohen Aloro wanted to do. You know, this Pityon Haben, the redemption of the firstborn. Yes. Terrible. Again, I had no issue with it, but again, it has to be tied back uh, to the law, and we also have to find out when it needs to be done. In other words, if the Rambam says that the first thing is to crown a king, and even before that, you have to have a Sanhedrin, and the Rambam doesn't say that before that you have to make a pigeon a for Asa, so then we can do it before, during, or after. It's not uh, in. <laughs> Shazman Grama, it's not something that time is not is not of the essence when it comes to that, especially not according to Jewish law. And, you know, because there's no end. Everybody has an idea of what they believe is the perfect thing that's going to bring the Shia. But we have to just stick to the law. We have, you know, if we really want to do what Hashem wants and not what we think is best. So, okay, so let's see. We have here, um, do, do not delay when you're bringing your harvest. Why would you bring your harvest? <laughs> So it says, Mele Adcha is like Male, is full, which is when you're bringing your, uh, uh, when, you're, when your harvest is ripe and you need to bring Bikurim, you bring a sample of some of the fruits to the temple for uh, uh, as for part for of the three times that you. I mean, the uh, would be the festival. It doesn't say it. I mean, is because, it? Yes, so Shavuot, I believe, yes. Yeah, it depends what you're growing. It's it's in general. And then Dimacha is Truma, which is again, uh, it's Dimacha is uh, like a language of crying, actually, of like tears. Uh, let's see what the uh, Targum Unculus, he just says the same word again. Um, he uh, Rashi doesn't know why it uses the language of Dema, of a tear. But it's also possible, from what I understood from other places, that um, sometimes somebody is in trouble and he will say, Hashem, if you get me out of this mess, I promise to give X, X amount of money to the temple. So maybe it's referring to that. Okay. And uh, we have different... Okay, so this is different um, laws. There's a lot of crazy laws... And like I told you in the beginning, in the beginning, we actually have a Messiah. We have a tradition that Parshas Mishpatim was actually said at Mount Sinai. This Parsha, this portion, Torah portion, was said at Mount Sinai together yeah. with the Ten Commandments. Okay, I mean, let's see what uh, else we have here. Yeah, we have might be the most, um, We had this in our uh, Shabbat reading, and I actually only did, you know, the. Uh, the last uh, chapter 24 from Exodus, because it comes, you know, come up uh, here, here, let's go up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nad Nadab and Abihu, they later on die because they bring fire and fire and 70 of the elders of Israel and worship from afar. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people go up with him. And then later on, you know, but on the nobles and the children of Israel, he did not lay his hands. So they saw Hashem and they ate and drank. So the seven, I mean, here is the concept of the 70 elders from all Israel. 
already in the concept that you know that Hashem deals not only in a singular just one guy no okay you need one guy to set this whole thing up but then you have you know very much um, as you have like in your background you know you have your judges you have the Sanhedrin you know the elders of the set you know we call it the oh, seven I, can, I, can I point to that as well because yes the, the mountain represents ego and Mount Sinai was actually a very small mountain and he, and all the bit the, the medrash tells us that all the big mountains were arguing i'm the biggest mountain the torah should be given on me and there was this whole fight between the mountains and mount sinai wasn't even part of this fight because he was just like a you know just like a hill and yeah and then Mo moshe said this is the mountain that we're going to give the torah on this small little mountain and because he because the whole concept of a mountain, according to Kabbalah, according to Hasidus, is ego, is pride. But but the Torah needs a little bit of pride so that the people should respect the Torah. But it's not that kind of pride that you see that's just out of proportion. And this is another interesting thing, because Moshe Rabbeinu puts a gate, and Hashem tells him twice, do, do not let anybody go on the mountain. In other words, nobody should take pride the Torah's pride is a very delicate thing because the Torah teaches us to be humble and all these things. So a regular person is going to come and say, I'm a big righteous man. He's just going to mess everything up. So the only people that were allowed to take pride in, in the Torah were the 70 elders. They're the only ones and Yeshua Benun. So Moses, Yeshua Benun, and the 70 elders were the only ones on the actual mountain. And the reason they were able to, to be on the mountain is because they were humble enough, but they were also responsible to protect the, the honor of the Torah. So they were part of the Torah's pride, the kavod of the Torah. Now, it, it says in another place, if you, want, if you don't want to bow to the king, become one of his uh, servants, you know, stand behind him. So yeah. this is like the, um, the Sanhedrin really, they're trying their best to study the Torah and bring it to the to the Jewish people. Oh, I have one more thing I see. I notice here. Um, let's go to uh, chapter thirty. Uh, sorry, twenty three, um, <clears throat> verse six. So we see lo sate mishpat evyonecha berivo. You should not tilt the judgment of your poor. Uh, of your poor, right. Now, so, I, if I believe correctly, I might be misinterpreting, but I believe correctly that you should not, if you see two people in front of you, even if it's a poor guy and a rich guy, and you're saying to yourself, okay, look, you know what, we'll let the rich guy lose because he has money anyway. No. Yeah. The Torah says, don't see the poor guy and say, oh, I'm going to give him the benefit. doesn't work like that. Justice is justice. Okay. Midvar Shaker Tirvak, from a lie you should stay of the law. Equal application of the law without yes. regard of person. Without biasy. Yes. Yes. Midvar Shaker Tirchok from a from a lie you should distance yourself. The Nakiv Sadiq Al Tarog and a righteous and, and pure should not kill Rasha because I will not give I Just will not uh, give uh, answer to a Russia. I will not justify a Russia. I not just. I will man. not justify wickedness. Um, yes. Oh, the Naki al Tarog and a clean one do not kill, even if he is not righteous, which he did not come out righteous in the din. If he is, if he is, if he is found not guilty of death. You should not kill him. Because if you have, a, in other words, if you have a way to get him out of the punishment, then allow him out. Uh, and, and if you have, so it goes into a whole detail here about if you have one guy who says, I have, you know, evidence against him, we don't bring him back. The Tzadik Altar, one second. Okay, so when we say a righteous person, we have the, 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 the Tanya, the Alta Rebbe actually speaks about 
He says, you have two kinds of righteous people. One person is a tzaddik because he has more merits than sins. So if he has 51 merits and he has 49 sins, then he's righteous. But he's not really righteous. He's righteous in the judgment. He walks away clean because he has more merits than sins. And then we have another kind of righteous, a tzaddik, a real righteous person that he is actually righteous. He never thinks or never speaks or never acts. Anything that's against Hashem. So here we're talking about Sadiq in a case. In a case, so he's actually um, righteous. That means he made it out alive from the court case. You know, not that he's actually a Sadiq. But in any case, we also have another uh, din here that if 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 there was a judge that um, decided to take the 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 opinion to uh, to prosecute. So in those days, there wasn't a lawyer for your defense and another lawyer for uh, against you. It was, you're standing in front of the judges. You might have three judges. You might have 23 judges. You might have 70 judges. You're standing in front of the judges. Some of the judges will decide to prove you're innocent and fight in your favor. Some of the judges will try to fight against you, say that you deserve to be punished. So if we have a person that goes to court and one of the um, judges starts to say things against him, in other words, trying to get him in trouble, prove that he's not worthy, we don't bring that judge again if he has another trial later. That's what it says here as well. In other words, once he's a tzaddik, he tzaddik rasha. Once he's a nakib tzaddik al ta'arog, Another thing the sages say is do, uh, what the oral tradition tells us is we don't bring, once a person is right, we don't bring back. So this is like, for example, when, uh, in my case with my parents, my mother was thrown out of court because they found that she was lying. And uh, she kept coming back again and again and again um, to try to prove that my father yeah. has a problem and that she deserves more child support, whatever, just messing, messing them up. So I guess in this case, if there was already a push for injustice and, he, and the person was found innocent, you cannot push again for injustice again. In other words, he is a tzaddik. And, is also in and America, then we go to the next one, which is the big is, one. Um, uh, Joseph, isn't it in American court system, once you are brought in for a, a court for one crime, and you are uh, proven innocent, then uh, this crime cannot be brought uh, against you again. You, they, nobody can bring you again uh, before court. Uh, I don't, I, it, it seemed, maybe that's officially the law, but I know that my mother was thrown out a hundred times and brought back in a hundred times. Maybe, you know, you'd make a different, yeah, okay. different receipt. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know, but uh, definitely yeah, but this is, uh, like when that. we are talking about child support and so on, it's one thing, but when we're talking about a crime, I mean, you kill a person or you, uh, and so on, I mean, like a real crime, you know, where you perhaps, you know, either onto death or, I mean, when it's something, you know, but it's, you know, I think this today's um, court cases, most of the time is not about justice, it's just about to suck the other dry of cash, that's it. You know, without yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. it's uh, the, the the system and the system uh, relies on on uh, on on the pain and suffering of of the people that come through their door. That's yeah. why a Jew is not allowed to build a. Uh, uh, in, in the Chachamim said, a Jew is not allowed to build a secular courthouse in Rome, for example, because they would build it very, very high and they would throw people off the roof, like like pieces of garbage, and they would die from the second, the third floor, whatever the roof. So even building a building uh, for, for this court cases of, 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 of Sodom and Amora, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah is, is against the Torah because it's a, because it's a, it's a given that they're going to kill someone without real justice. So it's like literally being part of that. Okay. So the next one is Vishokhad Lotikach and bribes you should not take. The bribes will blind the wise. Okay. So if if the if the if the bribes can blind the wise, you can imagine, you know, of people, course. people that are not exactly that smart. Or women that are in court, you know. How easy uh, it is. 
<laughs> to manipulate it. <laughs> Not only this, you know, the uh, without uh, without bribes, I would not think that we would have a um, pandemic, and I don't think that we would need a uh, a gene therapy. I mean, this is um, without bribes. I think what happened now with uh, with the war in Ukraine, and you know, before during two years Corona. It would not had have had happened, wouldn't it be for bribes, where people get kickbacks for all kinds of stuff, shut other people down, and then uh, and judges closed their eyes and you know convicted the just, and uh, basically um, you know gave the uh, guilty a free pass, as it is to the day. Horrible. Absolutely. Horrible, horrible. Again, like we said, as long as the Torah is not in, in, in the books, as long as the Torah is not the, the final word, you're going to see the value system to, twist towards the spilling of blood, adultery, yes. and idol worship. That's just a fact. The moment we take the Torah seriously, we're back in business. We start to thrive and we start to live. Yes. Okay. Um, so he says, And it will twist the words of the righteous. So not only will you will not be able to see the truth, even when the righteous start to speak, you're not going to hear the righteousness in their words. And then the next one is Veger Lotilfats. You should not put pressure on the foreigner, because you know that the soul of the of the foreigner is is soft and gentle, and you were foreigners in the land of Egypt. So Hashem is warning us. And Rashi tells us that it is a very, very, very kashe, very, very uh, hard thing to put pressure on the ger. The ger is the the uh, you know the ally to the Jews the, that lives with them. Um, and in many, many places, the Rashi says the Torah warns about um, offending or hurting a ger. Because he's trying so hard to distance himself from evil, if, I'm, if I understood correctly. Okay. Baba Metziah Nun Tetz, for those who want to check the Talmud later. Okay. Um, and then we go right into six years we should work at the fields and gather the harvest. And on the seventh, we rest. And you do not gather the harvest. You give, you give, uh, you allow the poor to take from your uh, fields, and the animals should take, and then we go straight into Shabbat. So this is really, if we look at the the series over here, this is exactly what we're doing right now. Oh, you start yes. off with justice, and then right away you get into the six days, and on the seventh you rest. Six years, and on the seventh you rest. And we mentioned right when we're talking about how we should deal with the with the ger. Right away, we mentioned that the Jewish people were literally, you know, refugees from Egypt as well. And then we go straight into you should rest on the Shabbos. So you see here that if we have justice and we respect the ger, which is you know what we're doing right, right now. Yeah, man. You Even know, yeah, man. You know the German exactly. And then we right away get into the six days of work, and then on the seventh we rest, and then we have which is really the redemption. And then um, Hashem says in thirteen, everything I told you, hold it and protect it, and it, and and you do not mention the name of any other god. Should not be heard from your mouth. Come to me three times a year on the yeah, this is so very, very important for us. Very important for us because this is, of course, you know, part of our guaranteed uh, worldwide guaranteed religious freedom. So the the state has to guarantee that we are completely undisturbed, are able to exercise our religion. Meaning three times coming up per year, so for Pesach, for Shavuot, of course, and for Sukkot. Now we're having Pesach Correct. in front of us and then Shavuot. 
which uh, you know falls this year on the starts on the RF on the 25th of May. What an issue! So and um, you know we have you know the obligation to come, Joseph. We have the obligation to come. So for us, it's a very uh, very practical issue right now, because never before in the time was it so easy get on a hop on a plane, you know. And go. I mean, it's not like go on a ship and, you know, a cruise for, you know, and sit perhaps on a Titanic and sink or so, you know, it's like uh, an airplane took six hours, seven sink hours. Because of a Jewish conspiracy called the iceberg. It's a Jewish last name, you know. <laughs> but yeah. Oh, damn, yeah. Um, Greenberg, iceberg, <laughs> give me all this. <laughs> yeah. So, but so I want to say, uh, so we finish here. Yeah. Yeah, I think this so is we get to, very, uh, we should talk. definitely elaborate on this because this going up to Jerusalem, you know, a lot of people never ever did it. So of course you have, uh, you know, incoming, you have incoming tourist traffic, uh, you have bridge building going on, and of course you know, um, you know, people bringing their tithe and offering, their temple coins, and so on. So every time somebody is fulfilling this commandment, I mean, this has an economic out things. It's, um, I believe, you know, he's one yeah, he's aligning himself with the Hashem's narrative, with the Torah, yes. Yeah, and it has the most 100%. strongest uh, sparks you can release by fulfilling to go up to Jerusalem and leave your cash there. I think it's the most uh, most significant. Issue. Yes, yes, and of course it's important, just like we said right before that everything I told you, you should you, you should you should guard it like security. Like we said, Edom's job is also to create a perimeter, and yes. in that same verse, Hashem says, "V'shem Elokim Acherim Lo and the name of another god do not mention. Do, I don't want to hear it from your mouth. So Hashem is putting in the same verse that we said, like, Adam should create a perimeter. Everything I told you, you should guard. So at the same time, Hashem tells them, do not mention any other gods. So this is hand in hand, especially with what we spoke about earlier with the letter that we that we that, we, that I added my name to, you know, making sure that in Israel there's no missionary work and so on. Okay, so let's go to the end, um, verse uh, nineteen, and uh, we we finish over here. Reishis bikurei ad maschat avi beit Hashem elokecha. You should bring the first, and the best of your fruits to the house of Hashem. Lot of Hashem gdi b'chalevimo. This is the do not cook the the goat in the mother's milk, which is of course the separation of milk and meat. And then right after that, what's going to happen if we do this? So we go through this great chapter where we have justice followed by kindness to the foreigner followed by the seventh day we rest, the seventh year we rest, which is a redemption followed by Come to the temple three times a year. Do not come empty-handed. Followed by, um, separate the milk and the meat. And another level of mercy, you know, be merciful because the whole concept of do not kill the 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 the, 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 the baby and uh, boil it in the mother's milk is mercy. And if we get to that, then hine and so then we have the, the, the blessing of Hashem. I send before you an angel to protect you on in your travels and to bring you to the place that I have prepared. Right? Boy. Boy. And then we have again another warning, but I'm just looking at this. If we just look at this small chapter, I want to uh, stop here because we're short on time. But we just look at this small chapter and a half that we went through. You just see this redemption process literally yes. unfolding. When you finally think you got to the redemption, Hashem puts you another step of redemption. And you get to that, 
Oh, you built a temple. Oh, you're resting on the seventh year. Oh, you're coming to the temple. Okay, I will send my angel in front of you to protect you and everything you do. And it just keeps going. So it's really mitzvah, gorek mitzvah, like a train of, of positive energy, a train of, of, of fulfilling Hashem's will, and just smooth, just going into the redemption. We just need to put our minds in that yeah, direction. It, and we're to start with this. Know, this is, when you say smoothing in the redemption, I mean, this is here... Um, I mean, we uh, at the end, the 17 elders see God. And I think this is the same thing what we are experiencing because it says that Hashem will be visible again, you know, on Mount Zion when he's, you know, visible in the clouds and so on. So everybody who will be there, he will be experiencing the presence of Hashem. I mean, this is, a, I mean, this is what I signed up for. I said, well, this, I, whatever it takes. To, to, yeah, whatever it takes. Uh, I mean, once you understand Hashem is real, then you, you read this and you say, wait a second, he wants to come to visit us? I will do everything to do this. Think about this. If, I mean, uh, the last guy, you know, who experienced this was Solomon. And then you couldn't even... Yeah, and oh, I mean, the fact that we don't, you know, I think that Judaism in and of itself is like, um, you know, it's like you have a boss. He's not a psychologist. He, he's not an you know he's not an idiot. He treats you well, and you way he has all these promotions go up. And then at the end, you know, after a certain amount of years, you get to, you get to see the owner, the CEO, or whatever. You get to the top of the company, whatever. So even if you don't believe that you're going to get to the end, but if you're enjoying the ride, then it's also good. In other words, even in the time of exile. Well, when the Jews don't have this revelation of Hashem openly, of course, we have a story of the Tzemach Tzedek, who actually was crying as a child, and he said to his uh, to the Alter Rebbe, to his grandfather, says, why can't I see God the same way Abraham saw God? So the Alter Rebbe said to him, a man that's 99 years old that decides to get a circumcision, he deserves to see Hashem. <laughs> and that answer <laughs> satisfied the Tzemach Tzedek, and the Rebbe really took that interaction and opened it up to really understand why did that answer satisfy a seven-year-old kid? And what was, what was the Alter Rebbe really trying to say about that? And what was going on? So there's a lot of details going on in that small interaction. But uh, the point is that, of course, we should wish for to see Hashem and revealed in this world. That's what we pray for. But we have to also remember that as far as physical commandments that we should be able to fulfill, we need to go back to the law. Very simply, get the law done and uh, hope for the best. Ulf, closing statements? Um, All absolutely, right. Absolutely. Uh, today, you know, um, because it's very, very practical. Um, I honestly believe that currently people are freaking out what they see happening in the world and that in the moment they hear about our Sanhedrin initiative and that they really are able to become part of something greater, you know, to, um, to, to really build up justice in the land of Israel and from there into the world, you know, I think this uh, will fly. And I'm very excited, you know, for what is coming in the future. So... That would, would be me. Um, how about you? Or shall we cut off? <laughs>